morning. You know that after this is lunch, right? And before lunch, you decided to go to a security talk. Marvelous, thank you. But we need to talk about a few things. First, I want to know who I have in the room. Who of you is a developer? Who of you pretends to be a developer? Who of you is a manager? Oh, you can learn something today. That's great. Like, if for all of you, great. Um, but most important question I need to ask you is this. How important is security for you? Who thinks security is important? Uh, that was a dad giveaway. But the problem is, or the, the, the question is, are you actually acting upon it? And people will say, eh, kinda? Well, then comes the next question. Have you ever been breached? Have you ever been hacked? Who was part of a hack or a breach once? Okay, you will recognize what I'm going to tell you because I've been in one. And I'm going to tell you my story at first. Because there was some point in time when I was just a Joe Average back-end developer. We did cool stuff at a small startup which was part of a larger bank in the Netherlands. Um, note that we were still fighting for funding for next year. You know that feeling, right? You need to deliver that product, that features, because we need to make sure that the board knows that we are important enough. And then at a certain point in time, I had to say, ah, sorry, we've got a breach. And that is the most awful thing that I needed to do, because I was a team lead. Um, who of you is a Java developer? Or has heard of Java, been to Java, drunk some Java? At least you know what I'm talking about. Well, <clears throat> I'm a Java developer, so bear with me if you're not a Java developer, but you probably will get the concepts of this. The thing was that we built a small app on Android and, and uh, iOS phones, and we had a Java backend. The thing was we, that, that application was made in, I think it was 2016 or something like that, that time frame. Um, that application was there to search for houses, properties that are for sale. And it used to be anonymous. We used to be able to anonymously log in on your phone, no credentials whatsoever, but there was a choice that we need to establish a profile from somebody and store that profile on the phone like you're only searching for apartments instead of big houses with a garden or something like that. So what we did, we created a profile service, and I'm now giving you the TLDR version of this, uh, that has a profile. That profile was a generated UUID and a list of preferences. The UUID was stored on the device, so every time you went into the, the device, you get the same preference that you had before. And we referenced that with the server. All good. But you know how it works with MVPs, right? MVPs never stay MVPs, because it's like, that was a great idea. Now, from a business perspective, it makes sense to connect this to that. And you're like, that's not how we build things. Because the next feature that the board wanted, wanted us to create was a properties feature, as in the properties within the Netherlands, I'm based in the Netherlands, uh, is an open database. And say you want to sell your properties or see how valuable your property is or if it's applicable for selling that people actually want it, you could claim a property, as in, this is my house. Okay, and say like, hey, these the pictures are this, what is the, what would you give for that? That was basically the, the, the feature that we wanted to make. Okay, so we created a property service. Uh, but the thing is, uh, for the front end, we needed to have something. Okay, all claimed properties. Show them to my front end. Cool. You need to claim a property because if I claim the property of my neighbor, not good. Like the property can only be claimed by one person. Okay, so that means we have to change a few things. We have now a property with a UUID which is connected to the user, the profile, or the anonymous profile, or whatsoever, and the address. Sure, but it means we also need to have secure logins. So we created a profile that now has an email as their unique identifier that people can come back on any device and that it's actually claimed to a certain person. So done, right? Profiles, UIDs, fine. Um, and the previous features still need to be maintained. Hmm. Wait, what? So there was an option to find all properties that pushed out in JSON, all properties with the UUID, which I actually even did not need for the front end, and the address. Using that UUID, I could get the anonymous get profile by ID, get the profile back, and now I have a connection between an email address and a physical address. 
an email address consists of first name dot last name at ISP dot whatever. Wow, that's what we call a PII breach. Great that this was before the GDPR laws. The thing was that when this happened, um, this was the problem. You know how much time it took to fix this? Give me a guess. Four minutes and 42 seconds. Because we had a data breach, we found out, somebody came up to us, reported it, and we're like, hey, this is good. So we did this. Done. Pushed. Done, right? No, you're not. At this point, the aftermath took place. It take, took me months of paperwork and convincing the C-level that was pushing us for getting more features out because they were now saying, like, it's a shame that our developers are not security aware. For sake, really? You're pushing me for getting new features out, and now you're saying this. You have no clue what you're talking about. Because I, can, I only have 24 hours in a day. Of course, you've got the evenings, but I'm not willing to spend all my evenings. So the thing is, where do you put the cognitive, cognitive load of a developer? Creating security awareness. What is security awareness? And how can we solve that? So the thing is, we need to be aware that developers have different mindsets. And you can be in a breach without even knowing this. And this was a simple one. But the aftermath of getting into a breach, because in the end, we need to solve things. If things go wrong, they come back to me, and my team has to solve it. The aftermath is the painful part, not the fixing. Fixing took literally four minutes and something. I made up the amount of seconds. But that was because this was all. I'm Brian. I am a staff developer advocate for a company called Sneak. If you haven't heard of it, we do security tooling. So hence the fact that I'm talking about security. Staff developer advocate, I have no clue what that means. I, e I, I probably program a little and email a lot. That's how I describe myself. Uh, credentials, Java champion, Oracle, Ace Pro. I do something in the community with the Netherlands Java user group and the virtual Java user group and so forth and so forth. I'm based in the Netherlands. I'm living an hour and a half south of Amsterdam. So what are the problems? Focus on this. We try to deliver more often. Back in the day, say 10, 15 years ago, when I worked for the Dutch government, yes, I, did, I made that mistake. Um, we deployed three times a year, which is great, because now my pen testers have enough time to actually test it. However, when, they, when, we, when we look at today's world, and just before I joined Sneak, I worked at a e-commerce platform similar to Amazon, but not Amazon, based in the Netherlands, you can, you can, you, you can pr pretty much find out which one it is. Um, we deployed, at that point, four times a day. Good luck with pen testing. So we try to speed up these things, because features need to be delivered earlier, better, faster, and stronger, because we need to be in front of our competitors, which is a logical thing. Like, hey, if it works, ship it. But from the pen testing side, that doesn't work anymore. So now we have to shift that mindset back to something else. The problem is, if you look at development teams in general, there is no knowledge of security, or people are not security aware. And that's for a good reason. We are builders, not breakers. How much of you folks learned uh, during education something about security, how, what, what, what a path reversal problem is, or what a cross-site scripting issue is, what a SQL injection is. Not everybody, that's what I mean. And these are the simple ones. Let's go to things like reversed shell attacks, how these work. But these are concepts uh, we don't care about because we're building stuff, we're not breaking stuff. So the lack of security knowledge isn't there throughout the life cycle because although we do DevOps, who does DevOps? Or who pretends to do DevOps? Who does flow? I know Kim is in the room. Hey, think about it. If, as a developer, you also need to get things to production, you pretty much do DevOps. It's not, works on my machine, throw it over the wall, now it's your problem. That's the basic line. And yes, I worked with Patrick Dubois, for instance, when he was part of my team, and he made up that name for the company. It's actually true. So DevOps isn't a thing. DevOps is not a role. That's all made up stuff. But the thing is, we tear down the wall between developers and operations and try to mingle that together. Security is still a siloed expertise at the end. Like one security team working for 10 development teams or 
20 development teams or even more. How does that scale? It doesn't if you don't give that power to the development teams or that knowledge to the development teams. And in the end, we do need to play along because we don't want our customer data to be compromised. So sure, how bad is that situation? Let's get to that. Um, who uses Java? Well, then you, then, then you hopefully you, you get this reference. Say I'm making a Spring Boot application, a so-called so fat jar. And the first thing I do is I create some endpoints. And even if you don't read Java, you probably understand what's going on. This is the first endpoint I created. It maps to slash hello, and it gives me something. So who of you does code reviews? The rest of you does pair programming? Great, great, great. Um, what's wrong? Let me give you a hint. The user comes in as a request parameter. Without doing any form of sanitization or validation, I write this right away to a response writer. Yes, you should not be doing this. Yes, there are multiple other ways. But hey, I'm a junior developer, just new on the team. This is what I learned on school because all school curriculums are outdated for five years at least. So. We have, caught, we have caught this one. Maybe with some good code reviews, we can ca catch this one. New one. What's the problem here? I'm trying to upload a file. And I will give you the, the answer straight away. Don't worry. Just watch. Just pretend like not. But yes, I understand. It's fine. The problem is I'm uploading a file. And if you look at tutorials how to upload a file via a form and get it into your backend, you probably end up with something like this in Java. This is what this is what many of the of the uh, uh, tutorials will say to you. You get a multi-part file, and then you do some some magic on on it, and then we on the hard drive. And I stored it in this case to upload slash file dot get original name because I want to preserve that original name for some reason. But what if that file name this dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash slash at c slash bash wd depending on what the privilege of the user is where this backend process runs on I can overwrite stuff on your machine or on your cloud instance super cool the thing is the multi-part file is nothing more than a, an object representation of a HTTP request guess what the HTTP request looks like yes it's small the red part in the lower part is basically what the image is that I'm uploading. Somewhere in the middle it says name, file name, I will enlarge it for you, is brian500.jpg. What holds me back to capture this and to change this file name to dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash, I can just intercept the HTTP call. And what it means is the file name is metadata. That metadata can just so now be used to override something on the system that is not even part of your application, but part of your operating system, or maybe is part of your system, doesn't matter. But I now have the liberty to override whatever the, whatever the boundaries are uh, that I have with the user. Question, what is the default user for a Docker container? Root. Check your Docker images. So these things that my security team will not catch. Because they're looking at what firewalls and, and, and put things in, like, eh. But I could have caught this. Like, this is my IDE. This is just my Java process. I scanned this, and obviously I scanned this with my tool. Yes, yes, I know. But there are all multiple tools. You can use any, anything, doesn't matter. And it says to me, like, hey, dude, over here, you have a path reversal. In this case, it's a Kotlin file, but a path reversal over here. Um, let's look at that, and it says, It starts at uh, line 24 and goes all the way to line 27. What is the problem? So what you see is that I actually, using the original file name here, and I'm writing it here. So I could have caught this before it went to my main repository, before it went to production. But you should be aware of that, that these things can happen. You don't have to know everything. Tools can help you. Only you need to want to use this tool. And you need to want to know what's actually happening. You like file path reversal, what the heck is that? So there is help on the way. Don't get me wrong.
the biggest question is, who do you ask for your code reviews? Like, is that the junior on your team who is just there? And like, you know what a good thing is? You review the code because then at least two people looked at it before it went into production and we are compliant. Compliant doesn't mean secure. Because do I ask my junior or do I ask somebody who knows what we're doing? If I'm working three weeks on a, a certain feature, do I ask my junior to do this in 20 minutes because we need to demo this to the client? What choices do I make? And these things, this mindset, we need to get into. So, what do we need? Actually, it, com base, uh, it comes back to three things. Awareness, knowledge, and action. You need to be aware, yes, don't fall asleep. You need to be aware that this is also the case of the development team or the DevOps team or what, however the team is. You need to know what to look for because if you have no clue what a path reversal is, you're like, sure, whatever, how, that, that will never happen to me. And in the end, if you have tooling in place that, that, that can help you, action as in remediate that stuff and remediate that stuff early. So if you look at the modern application, we think about our own code, the code that we wrote, that we put on our Git repository that we might publish to open source. Like, okay, we're proud of that because we just decided that everybody does code reviews or pair programming, great. Um, but that's only 10 to 20% of the code that you put into production. The other 80 to 90% that's under the covers is probably a framework or multiple frameworks and libraries and more libraries because if you bring in a framework that brings in a library, that brings in another library and it goes five, six, seven layers deep. How much of that code is actually yours? Well, basically none because we borrowed it from the internet. Do you have any clue what's in there? Probably not because the tutorial Stack Overflow or ChatGPT said we used to have to use it like this. It works on my machine, ship it. 2017, going back pre-COVID. Um, this, we, who've, who've heard of Equifax before? Who've heard of Equifax before this breach? That's great marketing. I know somebody is, but that, uh, US. Uh, but mostly, mostly in Europe, we haven't heard of Equifax until this breach came out. Equifax, let's, let's shortcut, it's a crediting company that uh, calculates crediting scores, for instance, for uh, US customers. Doesn't matter, because I'm, because I'm not going into the company, but what they did, they built their, um, application based on a framework, Apache Struts 2. And someday, at that point, that, that framework was vulnerable. So the thing was, vulnerability was already found and disclosed and there was a newer version out in March. The breach happened in May. Check again, how do you work? If something is done, get, get the next feature on your Jira board and say like, as a product manager, I want you to, if it clicks on this, it does that. Nobody tells me something about security. Nowadays, scalability is implicit because we're on the cloud and it costs money, but security? Eh, you should be secure. What does that mean? Thing is, if you keep focusing on new features and not looking at what is, what is already in production, you might get caught with this, or this is what happened. It was already fixed. Uh, people were in for 76 days before they found out there was a problem, and over 140, 140 million US customers were compromised at that point. 2.0 billion is an estimation what the what the damage is. Uh, it's probably more because of brand damage and that kind of kind of stuff. But net, not get, net, let's not get into the actual problem. Let's go into the application because I have an application here, and it is just a Java application that has that same Apache Struts library. Only that library this runs on Heroku. It runs on the big bad internet. Just for giggles, make sure that it works. Um, what we can do is we can create a curl request using a specific header. This is the header I'm gonna use. And I didn't make this up, no, I just got this from the internet. Who recognizes this content type? Because it's a content type. Who recognizes this content type? Come on, there are a few developers here. You're smart, right? No, I'm kidding, this is an invalid content type. It's not existing. But because you're using Apache Struts 2, you go down a exceptional flow and for, for whatever reasons you are allowed to utilize OGNL. OGNL, the Object Graph Navigation Language, is an expression language within Apache Struts. And with an expression language, I can call certain methods on objects that are in memory, or even worse, I can create new objects. New process builder, spin up a new process. 
that process is uh, give me the bash, like spin up a bash. Give that bash an arbitrary command and execute it. So basically I built myself an arbitrary code execution mechanism. So let's do this. Uh, let's use this one. I will explain in a second what I'm doing. So I'm using the header I showed you and I make a substitution. The word command that you saw goes out, the word env goes in, which is just the command for showing the environment variables on a machine. And it goes a curl request to HT localhost. No, we're not on localhost. We are on Heroku. So let's do this. Let's get rid of the localhost reference and go here. Hopefully this works. Yes, this. These are the environment variables on my Heroku machine. So that means I am able to execute system or terminal commands on, an, on a machine far, far away that I, I don't even know where it is. If I can execute env, which is not that harmful, well, maybe this information can help me to for my next hack, but I may be able to, depending on the user, to create new users, to delete files, to create a file with some content and actually come back tomorrow and execute it. Good luck in your postmortem finding out what the heck happened. This is the worst thing that can happen, arbitrary code executions, because now, depending on the privilege of the user, people can do all sorts of nasty things. And this is what happened basically with Equifax. Because they were using an outdated version of a framework, if they had updated it right away, or they were aware of that, then it, that this wouldn't have happened. But let's get to a more recent thing. Where were you on December 21st, 2021? I was trying to go on vacation. Guess what did not happen? Me going on vacation. Exactly. Log for shell or log for j. The problem in log for j. Well, we all know that, that that had a huge impact. The thing was, this logging framework was intertwined in all sorts of packages within the Java ecosystem and so in the Android ecosystem. Over 70,000 packages were instantly vulnerable, and we saw in our own knowledge that, from in our own client base, that like 60% of our customers had Log4j somewhere in that class path available and weren't even aware of that. In the 472, first 72 hours, there were over 800,000 attacks, mostly automated. We don't know how many succeed because nobody told us, for probably obvious reasons. So if you don't know how the Log4Shell thing works, let me give you the TLDR. Say we are logging something in an application. For instance, logging in with a password and a username. If password is wrong, you probably have user X login attempt one failed, right? Pretty assumption. You could do a weird string like this, a J and the I lookup. And basically what you say with a lookup is looking at some remote object and retrieve that object, not only looking at it. I could combine this with the LDAP protocol and what if I spin up my own LDAP server? What I did here on evil.com port 9999. In this case, I'll give it, a, give it back a reference to a precompiled file or precompiled class. That class is served to you on an HTTP drive or an HTTP server, comes back in the system, and boom, it gets executed. It's that easy. So what did I need to do? I just need to create a file. This is how I created the file. And this is the first exploit. There are many more, but see how impactful it is. I just created a file, pre-compiled it with an older Java, uh, with an older Java version, uh, and if I implement the object factory, I know that the get object instance will get called when it gets into uh, when the lookup is done. Well, in this case, I'm saying like, hey, uh, open the calculator because I need to calculate things. I don't know, but if I can op open the calculator, I can do all sorts of things. Let me show you. So application, um, just to show you here at the bottom, LDAP server is running. Oh, maybe I should do this, and you can actually see it. LDAP server is running, an HTTP server is running, and I'm running here on a, this, this is a Java application that runs here. So let's try to log in. Oh, let me just first get my one password off because it will scream at me that I'm doing something wrong, obviously. Manage extensions, get my one password off, or else my boss would scream at me. So let's do this again. So say username Brian, password, smash keyboard. Yeah, done. 
So what you see is that username Brian is printed here. So I know that username, I can use that to do that weird series of characters. What I'm doing now is I'm saying, hey, go to my local host, 999 evil, that's the LDAP server I'm running, and give it an arbitrary password. If I sign in now, you will see that the calculator spins up. Ta-da! This was easy. It took me 35 minutes to create this, actually before at the point where I understand what was the problem. And this was, again, because you're using a library that is vulnerable. There are still people using that same library up to today. The amount of downloads is insane. OK, half of them are mine because I'm creating exploits, but still. The other half is people, not me. <laughs> this is your application. This is probably the code you wrote. We take good pride of that code. But what about the rest? Have you any clue how many classes or files or lines of code are in there? People are targeting that because most of that open source is open source. The board says it. We can look at it. We can, we can traverse it. We can see what's going on. Let's not go into all the statistics, average count of vulnerabilities by language, how fun and games, how concerned are you that dependency might be malicious, some people are, some people not. People are afraid of, of direct dependencies. But this is one. Why sh we, who should be responsible for security? Because a lot of development teams are like, yeah, I'm just creating this stuff, right? Works on my machine. Got the ops guy or the DevOps engineer in my team that takes it to production. Works, right? Well, we did this in our state of open source security uh, survey a couple of years ago. We asked people, who is responsible for that? And developers need to be responsible for this as well. It's not just solely developers or security engineers or whoever, but if a development team is autonomous, and hopefully your team is, you probably make the decisions to make things or to solve a problem in your software, right? You got an issue, your team, you're smart, solve this. You're taking the right code, the right libraries, all these things, and you know nowadays that it needs to be scalable and maintainable because, well, we need to work with this for years. We also sh should care about security at that point. Not wait until my security team comes back with defects. No, we should already take that responsibility. Is that library updated? Is there a newer version of that library that I want to introduce? Does that library has known issues? Does that library is even getting maintained? The code that I wrote, is that, is that good code or not? Hey, Junior again, look at, you get me, right? So we should switch that mindset as well. If we all want to be autonomous, be autonomous. But take that responsibility. Again, awareness about these things. Knowledge, make sure that you know the things that, for instance, tooling can help you. And take the appropriate action. So for instance, I've got my project here connected to my GitHub repository. And if I went to this Java application that we looked upon, and yes, it has a ton of vulnerabilities. I get that because I created it. But hopefully it loads. But it says already here, hey, dude, you've got log4j in it. Just update it to a later version, and that's all. You're done. And just by connecting my code to a scanner. Wasn't that hard. So we talked about code, open source. But nowadays, that's not enough. Nowadays, we need to provide our stuff in an environment. For instance, a container. I already asked, like, what is the default user for a Docker container? That's root. So I did a research on vulnerabilities per Docker image. And this is a little bit outdated. So it's, uh, it's like oh, the OpenJDK image is now deprecated, I know. But you see that different images bring in different stuff. But what do you know? Like, the thing is, do you actually know what this image brings in? Because the first line on a Docker file is probably from Ubuntu from something. In many, in uh, some rare cases, it's from scratch. But in most cases, it's not. Where is the node image based on? Because I just used the latest, right? Works on my machine, ship it. The latest is, 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 is based for node is, is based on a full Debian uh, distribution. Do you need full Debian for your microservice thingy? Probably not. There's a ton of libraries, a ton of executables that can be part of an attack chain. Things I used, I showed you now are direct attacks, but most attacks are not direct attacks of 
part of a chain. I can do this, oh, now I can tag this along and that, and all the ingredients are there connected together, and then boom. I've got a demo for this because I like these things. Um, let's go into an application. The application runs here, hopefully. Yes, same application as we saw before, only this time it runs on localhost. It actually runs in a container. So let's go to here. It runs here in the container. Let me show you. things. I don't need the whole JDK. I don't need Maven. I don't need, I don't need, I just need my artifact. So I copy that artifact into a second stage that is based on Tomcat 8.5.21. What is wrong with this Docker file? Everything. First, well, 100 points. It doesn't have a user. That was for an obvious reason because I want to execute things as root. But 8.5.21 is hideously old. Let's take a look. 8.5.21 has this problem, an arbitrary code execution, just chipped in your container for your convenience. What you can do is um, it was possible to upload a JSP, a Java server page file, to the server via a specially crafted request, and the code in there would be executed. Let's go to my favorite database, the exploit database. And there's an exploit ready because it's an old thing. It is a Python script, and a Python script creates that specially crafted request. Um, does two payloads. The first payload is just this, a print line with all A's to show if it actually works, if all the A's got, got printed, fine. Then we can go, go, can go to the second step, create a form with a text box and a submit button. And every time I click submit, the text goes to runtime.getruntime.execute. So I just execute myself, I execute that command that I'm putting in, and then I wire the buffered, buffered reader to a writer to show it on my screen. I'm creating myself a web-based shell. Cool. Just showing that this poc.jsp and pwn.jsp do not exist yet. I loaded the script's already over here. So let's check if it actually works. Check. Vulnerable. Cool. Let's check over here. POC.jsp now has all A's in my screen. So that specially crafted request works. Let's do the second one. And it says to me here, uploading, oh sorry, Uploading web shell. Let's see if it works. Cool. I'm root. And I can do all sorts of things because I did. The, I made the mistake by not updating my base image. Regardless if my application is actually updated, it doesn't matter. I'm not attacking your application. I'm attacking your container. But nowadays, your container is part of your code. You're part of your code base. And in the end, if something goes wrong, they come back to your team to fix this. So you better prevent this. So this is part, is again, a dependency we're working on, we're working with. And we need to take care of that as well, unfortunately. So you see, even by not touching my application code, I can do all sorts of things with the environment if you're shipping the wrong environment. And how many people are creating Docker images, hey, and if I don't touch the application anymore, just leave the Docker image as is. Well, maybe it's, it's worth looking at that as well. Obviously, we can also look at infrastructure as code. Not going into that today, but that is, for instance, your Kubernetes files and see if your configuration is right or wrong. There's a lot of going on there, but I'm not going into that for the sake of time. But again, it's about, it's about awareness. The Docker image is also part of your code. It's also something we need to take care of. If something goes south, they come back to me. It's about knowledge, knowing if the Docker image that you're using is actually good enough or is vulnerable, or maybe what, what can I do about that? 
And if you know that, take action by rebuilding your application or rebuilding your container, even though your application did not yet change. For instance, if I, I, did, I, did, I did a scan here on my local machine, and it gave me all the vulnerabilities, obviously, from the, from the application, but it also showed me something here. Like, hey dude, you're using Tomcat 8.5 for 21, which has over 700 vulnerabilities, and 70 of them are critical. If we update it to 8.5.94, which is a minor update, I only end up with 38. Guess what? If I would do this, rebuild, restart, and do the try, try this again, this will not happen. So just updating the base image is also your responsibility, or the company's responsibility, but you have influence on that. And which I already told you, the aftermath is the most hideous part to deal with, not the fixing. So how should we make this work? Well, this is the, this is the commercial slogan for us. Create a security champion program. Because we're all champions, right? You get a medal, and you get a medal, and you get a medal. But there is some truth in that. So what do we mean with a security champion program? Basically what we try to do with DevOps as well. Say we have one security team, and that needs to serve multiple engineering teams. How does that scale? It does not. So we need to bring that knowledge from the security team to a certain extent into the development teams, because we work autonomously. So let's make somebody, hopefully, like this is an ideal world, let's have somebody in that team that has that security hat on, is still an engineer, so knows what he or she is talking about, but has that security awareness and is the liaison for the security team to say like, hey, is this the good way to doing this? Question things, should we do this? So instead of going directly to the security team and overwhelm them, let's delegate that to somebody in the team Educate them, because you cannot ca educate everybody on everything. That's impossible. But divide and conquer. Like you also have a dev DevOps engineer on your team, hopefully, or somebody that knows how to build these hideous pipelines. Because I can build them, but they won't be pretty. And they will circumvent all sorts of checks. Trust me, because it's, it's faster, way faster to not go to QA or security. It's fine, especially at 3 in the morning. So let's say we want to have a security liaison, or however you want to call it, in every team. So delegate that into the teams. How should we get started with that? Well, there are some preconditions, and there is no hard game plan for that. But we should strive for this. First of all, it needs to be developer focus. What we mean with developer focus is these people, or the people in the team are developers, or DevOps engineers, or test engineers, all on the development team. They have different needs than the security team. Look at what a developer can gain from it. It can be, like, look at what their pain points are and see how you can solve them instead of blocking them. Because most security teams just block you. As in, it's not compliant, you cannot go to production. But what if it's three in the morning and my customer is screaming and we're losing revenue for $2 million a minute? Trust me, you wanna go to production. And sometimes I have a good reason to neglect something. But I can only make this understanding or this decision if I'm informed well enough. So it needs to be security or developer focused. What does the developer wants to gain with it? No developer wants to create insecure code. I don't believe it. Instead, in, unless it's me, because I need to do these kind of things. Yes. You need to have executive sponsorship, which means if the CPO or the CTO that does development and the CISO are not aligned that this is also, uh, also a, a job for the engineering team, then we're done. I mean, if we agree that it is the thing and we pass that down, and we don't say as a uh, CTO, no, 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 this feature is more important than security, yeah, then, your then, then the teams will, fo will focus on that feature. If, if, the, if the CTO says, okay, we need to take our time, we need to make sure that what we put out is actually not vulnerable, or at least we have thought about this and we have a process, or at least, we know what we're doing instead of, right. If that sponsorship is not there from the top and in the middle layer all the way down, then we're done. So we need to have that. Just having this as engineers is a good start, but everybody needs to be on board. We need to have clear guardrails. Security teams are very, very, very uh, uh, vigorous on blocking things like, you cannot do this. No, but we have autonomous teams. Like, say to a team, okay, you can do this, uh, like, if it's a 
vulnerability into a certain range and you know what you're doing, you can ignore it if you have a good reason for that, document it, and uh, go. Because it's not feasible to check everything. Unless it's in the system that goes into credit cards, whatever, maybe we should do a double check on that. But give people clear guardrails. I'm not saying that, no, if it not goes through the scanner, you cannot deploy it. I am the first person that goes around that, and I did during my work at a bank. Also, make sure that they have tools available that work for them. I mean, I showed tools, and these are obviously my tools. But if they don't work for you, don't use them. If they do work for you, use them. But don't dictate tools. Let the engineering teams choose the tools that they really want to use. If you don't want to use this IDE but that IDE, please go for that. If you don't want to use this scanner but that scanner, absolutely do. It's not the tool, it's the cost that we need to focus on. There needs to be constant coaching and mentoring. There needs to be somebody available for that security practitioner in the team towards the uh, uh, engineering team that, hey, I don't know what we're doing. I'm not sure if this is a good thing. How can I get feedback? So we need to have that availability and there needs to be constant coaching because things, the landscape changes over time. What is safe now can be unsafe tomorrow. Maybe we're not aware of certain things and maybe the security team has that threat level and knows what it is. Delegate that to your security champions and spread that all over the place. Encourage discussion with the team because you might say, this is not good. The team said, well, you're not, you, you don't know what we're actually doing with it. This is not getting touched, trust me. Because, hey, we have analysis, flow analysis on if this, that, uh, if, if this uh, method gets touched or not. We're not touching it. So maybe we shouldn't, we should deprioritize this. And last thing, reward and recognize. Not by, not, not by, not, not by my making the office pretty, as we said, we saw in the, in the, in the keynote. But reward and re recognize, I mean that, hey, instead of saying to a, to a, a team like, you have 10 vulnerabilities. That is blaming. Why not say like, oh yeah, okay, we have vulnerability. That's a given. But team A was able to um, deliver fixes for these 10 vulnerabilities within so many days. Good job. Make that part of the strategy to get your, get your uh, folks on board. And not coming just with a list of defects, fix this. No, my, team, my thing was to make sure that it works. This may fix this, right? So instead of blaming, recognizing that people are working on it, and not, and not take it as a given. How to start? These are the preconditions, but how to start? Look at your highest risk applications. Absolutely, that is, that these, are the, that's, these are the candidates that you want to go out. You will not get everybody on board right away. Absolutely not. And obviously, that if this needs to work, you want to have this uh, on a voluntary basis. That people want this, or somebody in the team wants this. Because if you say, you need to, that will not happen. But start with your teams with the highest risk. See if there is something that, hey, maybe this works. Look at the maturity of the team. If a team is just yet in place, just in place, it might not be the best, best, uh, best thing. They are still working on the application. They might not be up to speed yet. But if it's a very mature team with a lot of seniors on it that can take the load and know what actually happened in the past, maybe you can find somebody there that is willing to take that next step or to take that role. Maybe there are some people with existing relationship with, uh, with, with the security team. If people are aware and are triggered by security, give them that opportunity. See this as a next stepping stone on your career ladder. And obviously curious individuals. Look at these things and fit, filter out if that happens, if you find your, your, your person that is like, okay, I'm, I'm willing to, to give this a try. And if the first one is willing to give it a try, Maybe the next one is as well. Forcing this upon your team will not work. Because everybody says, we want change, but nobody actually wants to change. True, right? The thing what I want to say is, just shifting left, as a lot of security engineers say, is not enough. Yes, shifting left means, on my local machine, I can test and I can do all sorts of things. I can throw all the tooling in the world at you. And I still believe that my company makes great tooling that is applicable in every certain way, not just forcing you to work in a certain direction, but you can choose how to do that on your local machine, your Git repository, whatever, connect it to GitHub Actions or your, your pipeline, whatever you want to do, but that's just part of the thing. Yes, I can do this on my local machine and I can prevent that, but if upstairs 
they're not agreeing that I should spend my time on that, we're done. So it's not only shifting left, it's also shifting up or down, depending on how you lo look at the pyramid. It needs to be a continuous thing, because software is not a waterfall model thingy. Most of the times, if you have software, you created something, it's there forever, or at least to a certain extent, almost forever. It's a continuous process, so we need to make sure that we look at developers, what are their needs, and how can we empower them to make these secure decisions from the get-go. Because in the end, it's all about awareness, knowledge, so knowing what you do, actually getting the information right, and action. And trust me, you do not want to get kicked in the nuts. Thank you. This all adds in. I think we have uh, about two minutes left. Um, feel free to ask questions or to come up over here, but it's almost lunchtime, so I suggest you stand in line and get your food. Right? I'm here, I'm here the rest of the day. If you have questions, if you have remarks, if you say, Brian, you're totally wrong, you're an idiot, it's also fine. Come up to me, say it in my face. And th after that, we'll get a beer together. Right? Thank you. Appreciate it.